Welcome uh, to the launch of the RCN's History of Learning Disability Nursing Exhibition. Thank you all for joining us. Um, so we joined in person today. Um, this is the first library and archive exhibition since 2019, um, since the, the start of the pandemic. Obviously the pandemic isn't over and uh, many nurses will tell you how they're still struggling with, with um, with recruitment, with recruitment and staffing on their wards because of the pandemic, the challenges the pandemic's presenting. Um, but we're, we're pleased that things are starting to get back to normal a little bit now and we're able to meet in person like this. Um, one of the benefits through the pandemic is we've learned the value of doing things online. Um, and this event is um, fantastically being joined by people who are watching on Zoom as well. So welcome to everyone who is watching on Zoom. And we know we've got viewers from around the world um, so uh, a little bit about the RCN, uh, we're a UK membership organisation, we're the professional body and main trade union for, for nursing, um, it's great to have people here who are nurses and, and, and not nurses as well, great, great to share our work with you. Um, and um, myself, I'm Jonathan Beebe, I'm the professional lead for learning disabilities with the Royal College of Nursing. Uh, and a large part of the work I do is supporting the work of the, the Learning Disability Nursing Forum. So we've been very proud to be part of this exhibition. Uh, the RCN was helping us to celebrate 100 years of learning disability nursing uh, just before the, the pandemic started. Um, we launched a video uh, to help recruit more student nurses that we produced. Um, and we've got great plans for, for the year ahead about looking at how we can support nurses with competency standards and career pathways. So lots of exciting work to come. So. Um, so yeah, I'm really pleased to, to welcome you all to this event. It, it's, it's been a long time in the planning uh, and feel it, it's, it, um, it's, it's really great to, to review the history of learning disability nursing. Uh, when we look back on the history of learning disability nursing today, uh, it's easy to see it as um, quite barbaric, I think, it, it, for, for want of a different word, and, and how things were done back then are a million miles away from, from support today. Um, it's really important that we learn lessons from that and, and uh, how, learn how far we've come. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first speakers today. So the first speakers are joining us online. Um, we have Steve Walden and Owen Barden. Um, so just to say, um, Owen Barden is an Associate Pro Professor in Disability Studies at Liverpool Hope University. And Steve Walden is a lecturer in learning disability in the University of South Wales. So I will hand over to them now. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Yeah, so I am um, Owen Barden. Um, uh, thank you very much for inviting Steve and I to, uh, to, to speak today at uh, such a fantastic event. Uh, really, really exciting stuff. And um, yeah, we're going to talk about uh, a research project that we did jointly um, over a couple of years, really, um, about the history of learning disability um, involving two teams of co-researchers uh, who um, had learning disabilities. So I'm going to talk a little bit to start with about um, how we went about what we did and why we did it. Uh, and then Steve will come in uh, uh, towards the end, or sorry, halfway through and um, talk a bit about, about what we found by doing what we did. Um, so the um, premise really, or the sentiment that motivated the research project sort of comes from um, uh, a disability rights perspective. And you might well know that uh, slogan of the disability rights movement, nothing about us without us. And that's the kind of sentiment that, that underpinned this research. Because you know, Steve and I very much want to do research which is with and for people with learning disabilities, as opposed to research which is on uh, done on or to people with learning disabilities, which is still quite often quite often the case. Um, and the reason that we wanted to do research like that was um, not just you know, to be nice and because of kind of fuzzy feel good thing, but because actually we want to recognize and acknowledge and privilege the insider knowledge that people with learning disabilities have uh, through their through their lived experience. And you can 
uh, perhaps see that on the uh, on the research questions that we that we set. Could I have the, the next slide, please? Thank you, uh, Gary. So yeah, so the the research questions here are really all about um, trying to use uh, historical representations um, uh, in archive material in order not just to understand how learning disability was represented and uh, conceived in the past, and we were talking in the sort of 1850s, 1860s, um, but also to better understand um, the lived experience of learning disability today. Uh, and we honed in on uh, the story of one person, uh, a lady called Antonia Grandoni, and you might be able to see a couple of um, pencil portraits of her on, on the screen here. Um, quite intriguing portraits um, in the way that she looked. And we analysed um, both those portraits and um, uh, a sort of four or five page case history um, in a book uh, by somebody called Dr. William Ireland, who was very prominent in the 1850s, 60s, 70s uh, in the study of what were then called idiots and imbeciles. Uh, and so we analysed both the text and the case history that, that we found. And I'll talk a bit a little bit more about how, how we did that. Could I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so the archive that we used was the UK Medical Heritage Library Corpus. Um, I guess some of you might be familiar with this, but it's a huge uh, archive of 66,000 history of medicine texts, which does make it a fantastic resource, uh, but it's not massively accessible. Um, and so the first part of the research was um, me actually hunting around in the archive looking for source material and honed in on um, Antonia's story because it seemed so ripe for analysis with the pictures and the case history. Uh, and then after we'd selected that material, uh, Steve and I both ran workshops um, with uh, two teams of learning disabled researchers where we analysed both uh, the pictures and the portraits and the text um, and uh, generated uh, creative output it's like the collage uh, that you can perhaps see on the on the screen there. So Antonia, Antonia Grandoni, she uh, lived in Italy. She lived in a, a, an institution, a, a hospital for most of her life. Um, and um, after she died, uh, a sort of post-mortem case history was published. Uh, which William Island sort of pieced together from the reports of five other doctors. And, and that was that that was our source material that, that we used in the book, uh, or from the book, I should say. And I'll tell you now about how we went about analysing that. Um, so could I have the next slide, please? Sorry, I think we skipped one there. Yeah, there we go. So we used um, three very simple prompts, actually, uh, as a way of demystifying the whole research and the whole analysis process. Um, and they were, how is Antonia described? How does that make her sound? And how does it make you feel? And from those three simple prompts, we generated pages and pages and pages of analysis and interpretation um, enough to wallpaper uh, the room that you can perhaps see on the slide there. And then after we'd done all that analysis, we moved to a second stage, which was responding to that material, which was to create some um, artworks um, in the form of the collages, like you saw a moment ago, uh, and also uh, graphic illustrations, like you can perhaps see on the screen there. And through that process, which also generated a huge amount of discussion, like hours and hours and hours of discussion, uh, we got insight into not only how learning disability was constructed and perceived in the 19th century, uh, but also uh, the lived experience of learning disability today. And we got some amazing insights, uh, which Steve will um, uh, talk a, a bit more about in a moment. And it wasn't an easy process. We, we had some really harrowing stories there, as uh, Jonathan was just alluding to, you know, we had 
stories of people with lived experience of electroshock therapy, which was pretty horrifying, stories of sexual abuse, stories of institutionalization, and so on. So some of it was quite grim, it's got to be said. Uh, but at the same time, it was um, much of it was also very enjoyable. People loved doing this project and they loved uh, doing research in this way. Uh, and so I hope it's something that, that people will perhaps consider doing uh, doing more of. Um, but Steve's going to, I'll hand over to Steve now and he'll talk about uh, what we actually uh, found in a bit more detail. So uh, next slide, please, Gary. So as, as you can see from the slide there, what we found was couched very much in salutogenesis. It was either positive salutogenic drivers that became obvious. So these were comparisons that our team research participants with learning disabilities compared with their own lives and then looked at what would they like to do to make things better for Antonia. So some of the key themes that came out was belonging, empathizing. They really did empathize with Antonia because although this is some 180 years later, there were experiences in Antonia's life that they not only recognized, they spoke in quite detail and sometimes quite harrowing detail about very similar experiences in their own lifetimes that they'd lived. One particular key example was one of my older um, team members who mentioned having to go away to a boarding school and wasn't allowed to have her name on any of her belongings. She was reduced to a number. And that brought us, to, that was one of the key examples around the dehumanizing theme. People with learning disabilities having their identity as a human being and as a person taken away and just being referred to as a diagnosis or as a, a, a group of issues rather than a human being with wants, needs, desires the same as the rest of us. They wanted to rehumanize Antonia. They wanted to give her that individuality back. Um, one of the examples that um, came through in both of our teams was, well, they were like, well, could they give her a hair back if there was a way to do it? We weren't sure from the text as to why she'd lost it, but they said that would be a way of giving her some of her identity back. Were those her clothes? Did she get to choose them? Could we take her shopping so she could choose them? These were, but some of them had actually experienced situations where they'd had their identity removed, as I said, in similar ways. And doing a good thing. They wanted to just do something good for Antonia. And they empathized along the lines of people had done good things for them. They'd done good things for others. But they'd also know what it feels like to need that good thing done for you because of the situation you were in. Those were the positive drivers. The negative drivers we came across were difference, discrimination, dehumanization. I've already mentioned some of the examples that pertain to the positive drivers also that outline those key themes. But one of the key ones that came across with the negative drivers was, was medicalization, being reduced to a diagnosis of a learning disability or a mental health disorder or a physical health disorder or in some cases all three, without the person who's living with them being seen as a person. And many of our participants had actually experienced that, in some cases are still experiencing that, and they recognize that in Antonia's life. And they said, well, we'd like to take, we would have taken that away for Antonia if we could. We'd still like it taken away for ourselves in some cases. And one of the examples that I was hoping would have maybe disappeared by this day and age, but hasn't, was people with learning disabilities who were being accompanied to medical appointments, clinical appointments by support workers or carers. And then the healthcare professional is talking to the carer instead of the person. This is still happening now. This is something as, as nurses we need to address. And that brings us back to control and segregation. They looked at how Antonia experienced that, particularly when she was institutionalized and taken away from her family to a large rambling Gothic institution in the middle of nowhere. Now, thankfully that is disappearing to an extent now, but with recent examples of um, Wharton Hall and Winterbourne View, they might be less rambling and less Gothic, 
we're still segregating people and we're still putting people through those sort of negative abusive experiences even today again something that needs to go that really does need to go but they recognize what antonia went through was something that they know if they hadn't been through themselves they know people who had and that gave us our overarching themes they were looking at becoming researchers particularly in the process of making a difference as researchers what can we do as people with learning disabilities for people with learning disabilities through research that was the overriding crux of that particular theme the next one was the power of language the labeling that antonia had to deal with the labeling that our research team participants are still having to deal with and then of its time and that looked at key differences between what we are doing better now but also some of the things that 180 years later are still drawing stark parallels with antonia's journey as a person with learning disabilities through the social and healthcare systems rudimentary as they were in her day some of these parallels shouldn't be there today but they still are if i could have the next slide please gary And this brings us to the impact of the project. The project's already had a substantial public impact through building engagement activities via the website. Uh, Owen and I presented at the Human Festival in November 2019. We've presented at a number of other conferences thus far. The Social History of Learning Disabilities Research Group, for instance, at Milton Keynes at the Open University. Uh, the Seattle Club Conference in London, we've also presented there. And recently, we've just been invited to present again at the Social History of Learning Disabilities um, group at Birkbeck College in, um, in coming months. There were significant impacts on the researchers themselves. Although they found it difficult to compare similar experiences that they've lived through to Antonia's story, they also found it very empowering because it gave them more of a voice. Again, a lot of our research team work with self-advocacy organizations through the Brain Charity and through People First. But to give them a voice through research, which we've done, again, empowered them further. And they commented on that. And after the main series of workshops was complete, we had a few further meetings, workshops, where we discussed the impact that it had for them in that context. They were asked to sum up, to give one word, their experience of the project. They come up with terms like enlightening, powerful, interesting, truthful, inspiring, joyful, and fascinating. So although it was difficult in some ways for them to interpret their experiences as mirroring and reciprocating with Antonia's. They also found it an empowering, enlightening experience to be able to do so as researchers. So to further give people with learning disabilities a voice in the research context, as Owen mentioned earlier, not as being the subject of research, but being the researchers. And if I could have the next slide, please, Gary. Just a second, I'm following the slides on my presentation here because my eyesight isn't so good, I can't quite see it. So what our thematic analysis um, really outlined more than anything else was there are some things that we are doing better. There, participation we're doing better giving people with learning disabilities a voice we're doing better but there are still some parallels with antonia's journey that are still evident there is still sometimes the medicalization of people with learning disabilities and the dehumanization of people with learning disabilities is still occurring institutionalization and segregation we are we've made great strides since deinstitutionalization de at the end of the 80s and early 90s. But as we can see from recent examples like Wharton and Winterbourne, we're not all the way there yet. A lot of work still needs to be done. 
So our analysis foregrounded continued perpetuation of deeper sociocultural tensions, these negative paternalistic tropes. There are still these incidences of people with learning disabilities needing to be segregated as people needing looking after, as opposed to just someone else who needs a bit of support. So we're still marginalizing them to an extent as an outgroup. Greater participation and integration needs to be facilitated, it needs to be sustained, and it needs to be taken forward. Considerable effort is still needed in Western society then to actualize social inclusion beyond tokenism for people with learning disabilities. It is insufficient to say that we are just saying, well, we put these residentials in communities all over the place. So we've integrated with people with learning disabilities. No, we haven't. We've just segregated them in smaller areas. It's better than what we had before, but it isn't where it should be. It's not true integration. We still need to work at it. And one of the ways that we can work at it is as Owen and I have demonstrated here, participatory methods can be effective and enjoyable way of doing research. People with learning disabilities, if you give them the tools, can do the research. It can be facilitated. It's just a case of using accessible means, accessible language, and taking the time and making the effort to make research truly available to people with learning disabilities. And as we've shown here, it can be done. And if I could have the next slide, please, Gary. These are some of the related part, um, publications. Now, as you can see here, this is some of Owen's initial research from which the project was born and to whom I'm eternally grateful, otherwise I, I would never have been involved. Through to a, cha um, a chapter that we co-authored in Professor David Bolt's book, but the one I really want you to look at is this third part, is this third publication here in the British Journal of Learning Disabilities. As you can see, Owen and I are on there as uh, authors, as are Dawn Price and Tricia Robinson, who work with People First and closely with our track team at the University of South Wales. Every other author you see on there is our researchers with a learning disability, either with brain charity or with, tra or with track at the University of South Wales. They were the researchers, they've been credited as co-authors and so they should be. And I would just like to end there saying that this is how far you can take participat participatory research if you take the time and you make the effort and you give people the learning disabilities a voice within research. So a final slide, please, Gary. And just a big thank you for taking the time to listen to our presentation on the research that we've done. Thank you so much, Owen and Steve, for sharing uh, that really powerful research that you've done there. Um, it was just fascinating. I think um, it's tragic to see how much more still needs to be done um, and the, the, the parallels that people with learning disabilities are still feeling today with, uh, with Antonio from the study. But um, I think what really shone through was and the power of humanity and that there is hope out there and simple things like changing the language we use and enabling people to live with dignity can make a, a, a huge difference and um, so we've got the power to, to make the change. Next up I'm uh, very proud to introduce uh, Bob Gates. Uh, so Bob Gates is a profession, professor of learning disabilities at the University of, of West London. Um, when I studied as a learning disability nurse I think every book on my reading list he edited. Um, he is a, a legend in the learning disability field uh, and in 2018 he was listed as one of the most influential people in the NHS so very proud to um, introduce Bob here today. You should always save applause till the person is finished. <laughs> okay I'm going to very very briefly take you um, it's a, a very brief tour, really, through an oral history project that I had the privilege to lead on. Um, and we've recently completed it and uh, published, uh, had 
um, a short research monograph published on it. It's a collaborative uh, project between the University of West London, um, Trinity College Dublin, University of Leeds and Northumbria University. Project team comprised a number of uh, colleagues from Trinity College in Dublin, from Northumbria, uh, from Leeds, and from the University of West London, myself, um, Paul Sutton. And I, I'm gonna make an acknowledgement at the beginning rather than the end, which is huge thank you to uh, Teresa Doherty, uh, Fiona Bourne from the Royal College of Nursing who gave us uh, an incredible amount of support, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And also the Irish Nurses and Midwifery Organization uh, for, for part funding um, the Irish arm of this uh, oral history project. So the presentation will report on a study that sought to contribute to an area of nursing research uh, where there is limited knowledge and understanding. And that is that of oral history. So oral history um, can be found and examples of oral history are given often from the perspective of people with learning disabilities themselves, which is wonderful, fantastic, and very uh, authentic and insightful. But excluded from that pretty much are the oral histories of nurses themselves and their careers and uh, their working lives are, are in supporting people with learning disabilities. I've just noticed on this slide and it occurs elsewhere, Ireland, they use the term intellectual disabilities, as does much of the rest of the world. In England, Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland, we continue to use the term learning disabilities. Just so that you're aware, but I, I'm using those two terms, learning disability and intellectual disability uh, synonymously. We sought to, to try and uh, unearth lessons that might resonate with the current challenges in recruitment and, reten and retention in nursing specialities. And you'll see why that's relevant in a second, uh, partly because it, was, it, it became incredibly difficult to recruit new people, new students of nursing into undergraduate programs, particularly in England, since the, um, uh, since changes to funding uh, have occurred. And probably one of the greatest outcomes of our study, which we're really proud of, is that we've collected all of these stories. They are now all uh, preserved in a collection held by the Royal College of Nursing's archive, and it represents uh, the largest collection of all history of intellectual disability nurses, learning disability nurses, um, anywhere in the world. So it's a significant um, achievement. The aim of the study was to collect and analyze data using the oral history approach to support and challenge our current knowledge of the career traje trajectory of intellectual disability nurses. We sought to explore their lived experiences, both of healthcare assistants and qualified nurses in England and the Republic throughout their working lives. We wanted to examine factors that affected the sustainability of these nurses as a workforce and try and relate this to contemporary issues of recruitment and retention. And we also wanted to unearth lessons for contemporary providers of health and social care uh, services and make appropriate rec recommendations regarding workforce sustainability. And finally, we wanted to create uh, an archive of intellectual disability nurses and their oral histories. And a recurring theme beyond the oral history of the, uh, the histories of these nurses throughout the 1930s, the 1940s, the 1950s, need, need I say, right up until 2022, is how do you attract people into this specialist field of nursing practice? And this is a poster uh, from the 19, 
uh, from the late 1960s, early 1970s, and we're, we're still doing the same thing today, trying to find ways of attracting people in. So we found there are many things from the past that still keep uh, recurring uh, today. Um, so we used oral history um, in our approach, and it was to give voices to uh, and elicit stories from nursing staff. I mean, up until now, uh, they've been chiefly from people with learning disabilities, but we wanted to give voice to some untold stories, which were the people who supported them and cared for them um, over a long period of time. So I've already said that it's, it's a common approach used in the, in the field of learning disabilities more generally, but not in, in uh, on or with uh, nurses. We benchmarked the project against the good, uh, good practice guidelines published by Heritage Lottery Fund, and we stuck to those throughout the project. So we were quite disciplined in the way we undertook the work. We sought and obtained ethical approval from both from the universities involved as well as health trusts in Ireland. Um, uh, we used an approach called snowball, snowball sampling, just as a technical term, if anybody doesn't know what that means, it just means I talk to you, you give me Jonathan's name, I talk to Jonathan, Jonathan gives me somebody else's name, and, and that's how we managed to get people. So we've got, a large cross, we've got a large number of people from across England and Ireland. We undertook uh, semi-structured interviews uh, with all of the uh, participants, and each interview uh, was, we, we planned for it to last an hour. In reality, uh, some people talk forever, and that was usually because I had so many other questions that I wanted to ask them. I have to say, some of their careers were humbling. They were absolutely fascinating. Um, and uh, I'd love to share so much more than I will in these 15 minutes, but uh, it, it really was a privilege to undertake this project. Uh, we digitally recorded, um, uh, I, I don't know what these, these things mean, it's WAV and MP3, I, mean, I have no idea what it means, but anyway, that's what they were, these sort of files, that's all to do with quality or something, I don't know. Um, we then, we then uh, sought the services of a prof professional transcriber and had all of the um, uh, tape recordings, uh, digital recordings transcribed. Now, this is an awful slide, and I apologize in advance. Um, on your left, stage right, on your left of the, um, both these boxes are what we call themes. So we analysed all of those transcripts and we came up with a number of themes. You will see there's four themes in each section. And then we then subdivided. So we made some smaller things called categories. And that gave us a way of managing and trying to understand the data which we found. You, we ended up with 31 uh, recordings. So it's 31 hours, you can imagine, it's an enormous, and as I say, each, each of those interviews was at least an hour long. So it's an enormous amount. The average uh, participant, their, the, the, the transcript to, to their interview was about 22 pages of transcript. So um, just to give you an example, on the Irish side of the study, uh, you can see that one of the themes, uh, the third theme down is a lifetime's journey. And then the categories are entering the profession, developing and upholding values and journeys ending. And journeys ending was actually most, most, most interesting. And then you have the same on the, on the English side, you have themes and categories. And I wanted just to share with you a couple of extracts from the things some of these nurses had told us. And so at the top of these extracts are the categories that they came from. So these, these two examples are from England. This is early interest in intellectual disability work and first experience of intellectual disabilities. 
I hadn't intended to become a nurse. I had intended to become, well, it was a remedial gymnast. Something where we've redacted material, where we've taken it out because we don't want to identify uh, too much uh, so people can point the finger at this individual. Uh, it's a bit like an occupational ther therapist, but because I didn't have the qualifications to get in, that's why I stayed on at school and got them. And this person then, that's how they became a learning disability nurse. A common theme, both in England and Ireland, from these nurses was the sense of justice, doing the right thing and making a difference. The main goals of my working life was promoting people's physical, mental, and, and mental and emotional well being and helping each person reach their potential, which I fully believe in that ethos, and that's what always has driven me. And here's a couple of examples of from the transcripts of the Irish nurses. I felt, journey's end, I felt I ran a good unit, and the friends that I've made, I mean, like some of those ladies that I now look after, I've, I've known them for nearly 43 years. I don't see them as clients, service users, which I hate those words. I see them as my friends that need a bit of extra care. And then being assertive, I'll, I'll say it up straight. And if someone, watch this editing, is annoying me, I'll tell them, and I won't. I wouldn't be all nice, nice, nice all of the time. I know where I stand, I know I'm a manager, I know what I have to do, and I know what's right and wrong. And I will stand by the clients first. Um, they come first. After that, then it's a bonus if I can help other people. We found very, very powerful testimony to the um, dedication and commitment of these nurses, all of whom, I have to tell you, all of whom, part of the project was driven by trying to understand um, the length of service and their contribution. All of these nurses had done at least 30 years service. And the oldest participant in the study, who was just the most charming gentleman I've ever met, commenced just as the Mental Health Act of 1959 was being introduced. That's when he started in learning disability nursing. His choice was to go into the Navy or to go into nursing. He needed his dad's permission to go into the Navy, so he went into nursing. It was as simple as that. Uh, absolutely fascinating. What have we achieved? Um, well, we've, we've achieved and secured 28 digital recordings that have been lodged with and now part of a, a professionally managed archive at the Royal College of Nursing, which represents something in the order of 1,212 years of nursing service. Uh, we've presented a project at numerous national and international conferences, number of universities, uh, along with um, uh, in Europe, Helsinki and Florence. And it was indeed at Florence and in the International uh, Conference on Nursing History where I met Teresa Doherty, who had invited me to get involved um, in this exhibition some two years later. Um, we seem to have been interrupted by COVID, uh, but we got here eventually. Um, we've published a, a research monograph, um, which contains a good deal of authentic uh, material from the project. And um, we also have a number of papers published and we're just finalizing a paper for uh, an international journal called Oral History. Um, I'm gonna flick through all of this because I've, am I getting, yeah, I'm either very near my time or I, I've exceeded uh, my welcome. Um, but we did come up with a number of, um, recommendations and, and, and identify implications for people. And I'm hoping that this presentation um, can be shared if people want to see it. And also I'm quite happy for people to make personal contact with me if they wish uh, to find out more um, about the project and the oral history project. And there is also a series of references there. So just a very 
um, warm thank you for your patience and for listening to me, uh, particularly also for inviting me along and to the lovely people who are interpreting for us, which I think is just amazing. Um, so that's, that's all for me. So thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you very much, Bob. That's fascinating research. You've been doing a really valuable um, collection of oral histories. Next up, I'm very proud to be welcoming um, Gavin Harding onto stage. Um, Gavin uh, has an MBE. Um, I do feel like I need to curtsy every time I see him. Um, he is a senior learning disability and autism advisor for NHS England and NHS Improvement. Uh, he is also the first person with a learning disability to be elected mayor. Um, it's, um, where, where were you mayor of, Gavin? Sorry. Sambay. Selby. Selby. Sorry. Um, so, boy, and um, Sarah Royce as well is uh, presenting with him, as, uh, who's a learning disability nurse and a specialist advisor for quality improvement with um, with NHS a National Learning Disability and Autism Programme. And we've got Michelle Parker has joined the stage as well. Um, so Michelle Parker also works for NHS England and is part of the RCN Learning Disability Forum. So I'll hand over to you without further delay. Uh, Gavin's going to tell you a little bit about what we're going to tell you about, which is right, amazing. Okay. It's great to be in person here today because um, we usually tell people to, we usually tell people they're on mute. So, and it's and it's the first time we've actually done appearance in an audience since two thousand and nineteen, and it's absolutely brilliant to be here today. But um, I just want to thank the nurses who worked hard during COVID. But we also recognise that some of the um, scandals that weren't so great of abuse during COVID either. And we don't condone that in NHS England. So I just want to thank the nurses who have worked hard on our behalf during the COVID, and that's not been easy for everyone. And, um, and I'm going to introduce my colleagues because it's great not to say you're on mute on <laughs> microphone. <laughs> and um, you've got electronic hand, can you use it up? But if my colleagues talk too much, I can't mute them though. <laughs> so I can't press the mute button on, and that's gonna be strange today. <laughs> so, um, but thank you for inviting us. And um, during COVID, I got actually promoted as well in 2020, just as the pandemic was just starting as a band 18, as the senior learning disability <laughs> advisor. So that's been quite tough, but I've been able, but no one's managed to shut us up during COVID either. <laughs> so I have been doing quite a lot of work and doing focus groups online and, and actually visiting focus groups as well during the pandemic. Gavin, that's really, really kind of you to recognise the work that nurses have done. Thank you very, very much. And I just want to introduce my colleagues, Sarah Wright and Michelle Parker. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Wright. I'm a learning disability nurse of over 25 years, not quite long enough for Bob, but um, and um, an improvement advisor with NHS England and NHS Improvement. Hello everyone, I'm Michelle Parker, I'm a nurse, learning disability nurse, I'm in the same team as Gavin and Sarah as a project manager and I'm also in the learning disability and autism steering committee with Jonathan, so um, it's great to be here. And this building brings um, historical memories back for me because when we were campaigning for um, after Winterbourne View from day one, we attended quite a lot of meetings here and they were heated mm. and things like that. So it's brought um, quite, it's quite good to be back in the building after so many years as well. I think Gavin, it'd be really interesting if you could tell people what, what you did before you came to NHS England. What I did before NHS England, I, um, I've been a patient in a, medium secure, being a patient in assessment and treatment units 
in and out of hospital. And in 2009 was the last time I was in hospital, but I was able to bring that experience when the um, unfortunate events that shocked the nation of Winterbourne View. But also, we've done, it's also been the biggest program in history that has made people change the way of nursing because we used to have those emergency calls on a Friday night saying, can we put a patient there, put a patient here? And, and actually it's changed and it's, so, and it's slowly changing. It's been the most difficult work anyone's taking on in history within NHS England. And we've had to deal with um, loads of regions and 144 trusts across the country. But Gavin, can I just... I think it's really interesting that we, we talk about your time as a councillor as well, because that's really exciting, isn't it? And you was yeah, there. It is. And the greatest achievement, one of the greatest achievements was 2011 when I was elected as a councillor. And then 2014 and 15 was the period where I was um, deputy mayor, but came the first mayor with learning disabilities as a um, in Selby Town Council in 2015. That's amazing. What year did you start for NHS England? 2015, actually, because I got a job Good around the same time as I was about to, and I walked in as mayor in my job on July the 1st, and I've been here ever since seven years now. Seven years. And, um, and I was joined by other colleagues with learning disability advisors, but we've actually, um, there's actually about 10 advisors now, including family care advisors. And there's one senior learning family carer who I work with, Mary Busk, as well. So it's a great achievement. That's amazing. That, that both of us were back promoted up to the band eight yeah. I think that's a really good time actually to invite Sarah the learning disability nurse to tell us reflections on getting to NHS England. Yeah well I think that one of the key things that we wanted to talk about in coming here today was really about that theme of involvement and true co-production. Now we as an improving quality team we spend a lot of time looking at environments that we're not happy with and we know there's still so much to be done but the times when we really know that difference is made and improvements are made are when people with learning disabilities are really involved and we're really listening to their needs and their views on how um, on how services should be developed. We also, and Gavin's going to tell you a bit more about the focus group works he does, but um, we recognise, and one of the, the things that I think was so powerful for us as a team is that when we're looking particularly at hospital care, that we get lots of different assurance from Care Quality Commission, regional teams. But we know that when Gavin does a focus group and goes in and really talks to the people who live there is the time he says it's a really good unit, I'm at my most assured. And I think that that's a real shift from just in a, we talked about tokenism, we talked about not really collaborating, but actually Gavin's role is so critical and influential to the way we work. Can you tell us any examples of how things are different now to then, sort of anything from, from the past, Sarah, in your nursing career? Well, I think it is. I, I think that's been reflected in a number of the conversations. I remember early in my career, with, in the late 90s, trying to talk to people about, um, well, I was working with um, a man who... Um, where I felt that in really listening to him, I wasn't able to see through his wishes. He wanted to carry on um, with activities I wasn't able to support him with. And that conflict that both Jonathan and Bob have described, and was described around, yeah. of wanting to support people, but feeling like we can't always do, we can't always make that reality. Mm. But I think that the collaboration the involvement is, is the way that we can really make a difference. Absolutely. Um, Gavin, uh, tell us a little bit more about hopes and your focus groups. And yeah, because this, I'm just going to go back to the beginning of NHS England because it was the first time they ever taken on learning disability advisors, and that was quite a lot of hard work. And um, and also, it was because we said, how are you going to change things if you don't employ people with learning disabilities and be taken seriously? So. In 2000 and around 2015 and 16, 
I suggested that we had set up focus groups, and that was in the first hospital in the northwestern Calderstones, because we said, I said, well, it's all right getting views, but you're not getting the views of real life experiences of patients like myself, because all we're doing is getting people with no disrespect, but we're getting views on people on partnership boards who hardly been in assessment and treatment units. And those focus groups have moved on so much now. It's actually, we, the, the biggest highlight of my work, I've got to say, was taking on the challenge of St. Andrews and actually getting into the focus groups in there and actually changing things for the patients. That's amazing. Sarah, we're going to continue work on focus groups in our team, aren't we? We are. We, are. we, we think that that sort of a, that approach of actually supporting um, um, Gavin and other people, other um, people with lived experience to visit hospitals to try and get that inside view and, and to hear um, it makes such a difference that that definitely is something we want to drive forward. Definitely. And the other thing we know, is, I suppose the other bit is that we know that as learning disability nurses, we'll always want to champion the views of people with learning disabilities. And I think that this is a really way that we can take this to another level. Absolutely. Because I think the pace, I think listening from the patient's point of view actually makes the, the management sometimes sit up and actually change the way they do things. And it's also helped to change our policies as well, because we're getting the real life things of what's not happening, what's not working. And that's one of the things that's quite important is listening to the patient view and voice. Yeah. And, um, and my, my thing was working with Norman Lamb right from the beginning, because he described if it wasn't from he had my insight, but he also had um, men cap and CBF campaigning on people's behalf, and they're still campaigning. And um, I know they say I've gone over to the dark side, but actually working inside the organisation of NHS England has helped make people understand, and there's still a lot of work doing out there. And now, I'm go and now I'm doing the HOPE project, which is um, looking at um, the way we do practice and getting people out of seclusion rooms. And we've spent, and we're working in partnership with Mersey Care with Danny Angus and Jenny on that. And that's one of the main thing factors now is that we're hoping to get the HOPE model across the, um, across England and we've got, practitioners working out there in each region which is hopefully going to look at the restrictory practice and how things are done in the future because we know things are very good with restraints at the moment and we're hoping to reduce that and and the host model seems to be a very good um model because it's not it's looking at the person rather than the the history and wiping them off yeah. and and that's and I've been part of that and I'm actually doing the training to be trainer trainer and um, be a practitioner as well that, that's absolutely amazing isn't it so there's two fantastic projects there that we've talked about but some very very strong themes and I think the main ones around inclusion so I think in summary um I'll invite Sarah first to see if there's any final reflections and then we'll we'll finish off with Gavin. We know that some of the um we know there's some good practice out there from the region, but we also not going to pretend that we've got a lot of work to do and change people's attitudes and change the way commissioning works. And um we just hope yeah. we can we can get to that result, but I know it's gonna take quite a lot of work and we haven't got things perfect but um but across the program we have got lots of things happening as well so and it's not just about transforming care it's about annual health checks and everything else in the program mm. so i would like to thank you for inviting us here and and if any 
And if anybody wants to speak to us, they can speak to us afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. To hear, um, I think I'll, something that strikes me about about Gavin's story is. Um, firstly, how it's really important that if we're talking about people with learning disabilities, we need to be including people with learning disabilities in, in what we're doing and, and how, we, how we involve people is really important. And something else is, is something that's really been central to learning disability in our training since the 80s at least. Um, if we want people with learning disabilities to be valued, we've got to give them valued roles in society. Um, and I think Gavin is a prime example how with the right support uh, and with the right attitude, um, people with learning disabilities can be the mayor of Selby, they can be a band A in NHS England roles. You know, it, there's no reason why they can't with, with a bit of creative thinking, a bit of support, people can excel uh, and, and Gavin is doing a sterling job and, and thoroughly deserves all the, all of the, the fantastic achievements he's getting. Finally, the headline, <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Sarah Lee. Uh, Sarah is a neurodivergent filmmaker and advocate um, working in documentary and narrative films. Um, her website is inclusivityfilms.co.uk. She's part of her lo local um, hospital's patient and carer experience team uh, and has been developing healthcare passports for children with complex needs and uh, disabilities. So very pleased to invite Sarah Rupps for her presentation. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you. I am neurodivergent as was mentioned and I do tend to go off on tangents but I will try to keep this as short as possible. Um, so I am a filmmaker but my reason for getting involved with the advocacy work is my seven-year-old son. He has a learning disability, he's autistic, he's non-speaking, attends an SLD school and it's very true what they say when you become a parent of a child with a learning disability you automatically become an advocate. It becomes a fight from the very beginning for the support and access needs that they need. I've been working with my local trust, East and North Hertfordshire, primarily at Lister Hospital in Stevenage, if anyone knows that, on healthcare and hospital passports. We're hoping it will reach across all healthcare settings across the trust. We've been adapting the format that's already out there. Other trusts use successfully, I know that, and Mencap, I believe, helped develop it in the first instance. One thing that we've added is reasonable adjustments to the passport because I found one of the biggest barriers for us was just entering, I'm talking about ED specifically, entering the emergency room, meeting the receptionist and not being offered anywhere quiet. And that is our biggest reasonable adjustment that we need, my son needs. So with the passports, we are hoping that it's gonna, it's for children with learning disabilities, but we've rolled it out. I'm working with the complex care nurse, Eleanor Willis at East North Hearts Trust to roll it out for children with complex medical needs as well. Um, we're hoping to facilitate some kind of training for all patient facing staff. So that will include receptionists so we don't come across that barrier when we enter. Um, there was another experience I was going to make. There was, there's many experiences waiting for specialist doctors because no one else wants to treat my son is how it feels. I've waited eight hours before to be seen by someone, um, which is a whole working day for most people that we're sat there waiting with a child who in a room which just isn't adapted for him and not safe for him. And it's obviously it's not safe for him to roam around a hospital, but that's all he wants to do. And he doesn't understand why he's waiting there. So I know that medical emergencies will always come first and they should, you know, more often than not, my son's condition is not life threatening, but I think he should be prioritized after that. Children with learning disabilities should be prioritized. Um, so yeah, it's, I will talk about something good now. So we've had two experiences. We frequent hospital a lot. My son has severe allergies and anaphylaxis. So we, we're in and out of hospital for medical stuff too. But I can only remember two great experiences, but it's important that I note these because this is the stuff that went well and I really would love people to do this. So I used the passport when he had an MRI. He was having a general because he wasn't able to keep still for the MRI. And the whole team shared the passport. Everyone read it. All 
involved, the anaesthetist, the anaesthetist assistant, they came to me, they tailored the way they put him under, like he did it in a different way, he said, to what he would normally do, because he recognised Nate's needs from what he'd read in the passport. And that was huge. It was done so smoothly. And it just, you know, I, his name's Tim Walker, that anaesthetist, and he was amazing. He really, really took on board the passport. And that's what we want the passport to do for every medical professional who sees charities and complex needs. Um, but a perfect experience, as much as it could be perfect for ED, was we went in, we were triaged straight away. The nurses saw us coming in. We were taken straight to be triaged. They didn't force any observations, not that people force things, but they can get frustrated a bit with my son because no one's ever been able to get oximeter readings from him. And, but this was just a very tranquil, peaceful environment. They asked me, what could they do to make this easier? What are his likes and dislikes? Um, they offered a sensory trolley that was brought into the quiet room we were put in. I know not every hospital has that, but they funded that. Um, weeks ago, we weren't offered it. So, you know, it's not consistent, but when it goes right, it is. I hate saying that it's amazing because it should just be that way, but it does, it feels really good when it goes right and it makes it a lot easier for all of us. Um, and we had next steps and everything all done within four hours, which was, which was pretty good. Um, so anyway, I'll kind of, I'll wrap up because I know that, you know, we're over time, but my hope is there will be more of you, more learning disability nurses. Currently at our trust, they only see adults and not children. I've been told that. And I think that's a real shame. I don't know if this exists already and this would be a dream for me for there to be a 24-hour liaison learning disability nurse that could come and um, be on call for those who are admitted those who are in ed children's adults outpatients appointments who can come and help be that voice because quite often parents i've learned to speak up but it is difficult and you don't want to be labeled as that awkward parent who's you know it's frustrating but yeah if there could be such a thing that would be amazing um and more than anything, listen to us as parents and carers, because we know our children best. We know how to treat them, how to administer medication, how best to take a blood test. That stuff's really, really important. And read the passports, <laughs> hugely read the passports. But I think if you could just ask the one thing, and I know I'm speaking to the converted here, but passing it on to people who aren't learning disability nurses, if you could just ask the one question as soon as you're meeting a family or a child with a learning disability, what can we do to make this visit easier? That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I, so I was just going to sum up with, um, with some thoughts, and it was thinking about an image that I saw in, in Bob's presentation. Um, you may have seen it was a room filled with a row of beds, uh, and that was very much how care was delivered in hospital settings. Uh, it was one big ward with rows of hospital beds next to each other. There would be communal clothes in a bag. People would come down and go, that looks like it fits you. That looks like it fits you. People would have had shared baths. They would have got in the same bath water as other people had been in. They'd have had shared toiletries. Um, and we were probably talking about you know, the uh, late 70s, early 80s, that this was, was still happening. Um, things have progressed a lot since then. And uh, most of the large hospital sites are now closed. You wouldn't see a ward environment like, like that anymore, but there are still some big hospitals to close as Gavin is working on. Um, but it, the care has changed. Um, back in 19, the late 1980s, there would have been about 35,000 specialist learning disability hospital beds. Today, there's about 3,000. So we, we've, we've come a long way and things have changed. Learning disability nursing has changed a lot too. Back in 1995, there were just over 12,000 learning disability nurses working in the NHS. Now there's about 3,000 working in the NHS. So we're doing different things now to, to what, what we used to do. Um, many learning disability nurses now don't work in a hospital site. Many are working in community teams, in intensive support teams, as hospital liaison nurses, liaison with GP practices, specialist epilepsy clinics. We're, we're infiltrating nursing practice all over the place. Um, where a lot of learning disability nurses are working is 
in the community. Um, lots of ladies with this work in community teams. Many are working in social care settings, providing clinically led social care and making sure that, that social care is, is effectively meeting people's needs. So I think what this exhibition shows is we've, we've come a very, very long way in a relatively short period of time. And I think what some of the stories today, particularly Sarah's story shown is we've still got a lot to do and still got a long way to go. Um, so I really want to thank all of the presenters today. It's, it's been incredible to hear all of your stories and all of your research and the work that you've been doing. Um, we, the, the, please feel free to explore the exhibition now. Um, and and um, thank you for your time.